And let's see, I have a slide for this. Um, what grade you're in, any hobbies or interesting activities that you do, and then why you want to be a Project Feed Ambassador. Um, because each of us are going to be working together pretty closely over the next year or so. So we're going to be working together today, obviously, for like three hours, and then every month we're actually going to be meeting online. So you guys are all going to see each other pretty regularly. And um, so I want to get to know you a little bit better. You want to start? Great, thank you. That's perfect. Very cool. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Claire Lindstedt. I'm a senior at Newport High School. Uh, I like reading and learning new languages. Cool. And I wanted to be an ambassador just to get more involved with sustainability and see if I can get some of that in the place where I want to be. Very cool. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Great. My name is Jake. I go to Isabel and I'm going to be in the book if you're like all these guys. Uh, I play the cello, I also play tennis as well. And I just wanted to learn more about aquaponics. It seemed interesting when I first found out about it and also kind of connect all the stuff that I've been learning from classes to the real world that I've never really had an opportunity to see before. So. Very cool. Thank you, Jake. Very cool. That sounded very rehearsed. I like it. That was like, I wrote this all out. I want to make a difference in my community. I love it. It was great. My name is Asia. I'm a rising senior at Newport High School. Uh, I also like playing tennis, uh -huh. kind of, like most of you. And I wanted to learn more about sustainable agriculture. Very cool. Uh -huh. I wonder if there's like a correlation between like environmentalism and tennis or something. <laughs> People that are in, always involved in those two things. Um, good. Do any of you guys know each other already? There's some of you like that all go to Ingram and where do you guys go again? Inglemore. Do you guys know Quinn Fung? No. She was one of my students last year from Inglemore. Anybody else know each other? Is she guys? Okay, cool. So the other thing to keep in mind is if you heard from someone from your school that's sitting around you today, that would maybe be a good person to think about collaborating with. So if you guys want to work on a project together at your school or in a community center or something like that, then you already are like up one extra person. You have a support system right there. So cool. You want to introduce yourself, Emily? And we also have one other person that's going to join us in a second. Her name's Courtney, and she is an undergraduate research assistant um, intern that's working with me this summer. So she's going to join us in a little bit as well. Um, thank you guys for sharing. It's good to know all of you. I know we've sent around a lot of emails back and forth, but it's nice to finally put a face to your name. 
Okay, so what we're going to do today, um, we have a couple of like hands-on activities where you guys are going to really understand how to do water chemistry testing and build aquaponic systems and all of that. We also have some content that you guys are going to learn more about um, aquaponics, about systems biology, about Institute for Systems Biology. Um, and then at the very end, we're going to talk about kind of how to integrate all of that and kind of design your project idea. Okay, does that make sense? So if you have a notebook, this would probably be a good time to take it out so that you can write down some notes. I did put this PowerPoint in a shared Google Drive folder that I'm going to share with all of you at the end of the day today. So you guys can always go back and look. But um, if you have questions and stuff, this would be a good place to write down questions. We can talk later and answer some of those for you. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is the Institute for Systems Biology. Has anybody been here before in this building? couple of you that came to the showcase, right? Anybody else for any other reason been here? No? Okay. So Institute for Systems Biology, we're a nonprofit research institute in um, South Lake Union, obviously. You're already here. And what we do is we typically focus on human health and human wellness, but we also look a lot at environmental health and wellness. And we have nine different labs here. They all have a different principal investigator that's in charge. And then underneath them, they all have research assistants and scientists that do research. And we all write grants to get funding to do that research. We usually get grants from the National Institute for Health and from the National Science Foundation. And then we do research here upstairs. And we're actually going to do a tour a little bit later so you guys can see where we do research and um, how that works. So the other thing that we do is in the Beligo Lab, which is where um, Project Feed 1010 is kind of pooled, um, we have a pretty robust education department called Systems Education Experiences right here. And what we do is we try to basically take the research that we do in the Beligo Lab and we turn it into high school science experiences for high school teachers and also for high school students. So we write curriculum. Um, it's all open source and free for teachers to use. And then we also have science teachers that come here in the summer and help write curriculum. And then they get a chance to do some research as well. So we have that going on. And really what we try to do is take all of these different disciplines and merge them together and make sure that kind of every lesson incorporates math and physics and chemistry and biology, all of those things, right? Because in the real world, these big complex problems that are happening are probably not going to be solved with just one discipline. Um, the more we start looking into food security and the global food crisis, you'll recognize that too. It's not just about growing food necessarily. There's a lot of other very complex um, disciplines that are involved in solving that problem. Okay, any questions so far? What we do? Okay, so typically what we do is we focus on kind of a common problem when we write our curriculum, and that's because when you guys go out into the real world, what's the first thing you do? You like read Facebook or the newspaper, probably online or something, right? And you see all these global issues that are happening in right around your area in Seattle or around the world. And if you're focusing on common problems in the classroom, you're probably more interested in and engaged in learning about them in the classroom if you hear about them outside of the classroom too, right? So that's what we typically do is focus on problems um, like cancer, tuberculosis, um, ocean acidification. You guys heard of all of those issues probably before. And then the last one that we'll talk about is food security, which you've probably heard quite a bit about too, the global food crisis. Anybody know, have you guys heard the word systems biology before? You know what that means? Anybody want to take a stab at it in your own words? Yeah. Yeah, that's one way to view systems thinking. Um, and then systems biology in, in particular is studying these complex biological systems, right? Um, and one example of that is something that looks like this. What is this an example of? Food web, right? A food chain is kind of like a simplified version of a food web, right? So this is a good example of a food web. Um, you have lots of interacting parts in here, right? And 
what we do a lot at ISB is we have these complex systems like this, and we end up using computer software to analyze the inf interactions between them. Because a lot of times there's not only, how many are there, 11 nodes here. Sometimes there's so many nodes that you can't even count them all, right? All the different things that interact with each other. And it's a lot easier to use computer programs to analyze the interactions between those things than to sit there and look at all the arrows and count all of the different interactions, right? So this is a program called Cytoscape that we made this graph in. And it's kind of a more simplified version of your food web. So questions for you. What do you guys think these arrows represent in this example? Flow of energy. Good. So if this is a food web, these arrows probably represent the flow of energy, right? From zooplankton to prawns, or from prawns to fish. Good. What about the circles or the nodes? What are each of these? What are they representing? Organisms, Organisms yeah. The components in the system, the organisms in the system, good. Okay, so these are two new vocabulary words that we're gonna be using a lot today, edges and nodes. So that might be good to write down if you haven't heard of those before. And finally, question for you, what do you think is gonna happen if I remove one of those nodes from the system? If all of these are interacting with each other and I take one of those nodes out, what would you hypothesize might happen? Problems with the system? Give me an example. What's one problem? Okay. Kind of like a chain reaction, good. So if you took out phytoplankton, you removed it from the system, that would impact the mussel population, right? It would also impact the crab population, the gull, the gull population, right? And then even up here, it would impact this food chain that's part of this food web, right? Okay, um, do you guys think that, I just wrote collapse here, but do you guys think if, if I took out the phytoplankton, for example, do you think it would have the same impact as if I took out this fish? What do you think? Okay, so if we took out the fish, there'd be more prawns, which means there might be less zooplankton. Okay. So do you think that has the same impact as taking out the, the phyloplankton? Okay, that's a good thought. Anybody have another theory? Yeah. Hmm. Right, okay, that's a good thought too. So maybe if you take out the producers, it will have a greater impact on the food web than if you took out the consumers. That's a good thought too, good. So in general, the idea is that there are some nodes that have a larger impact on the system than other nodes do, okay? They're not quite evenly distributed. There are some nodes that play a larger role than others. So we'll talk about that more in a little bit, okay? But this is one example of food web. This is actually an example from our lab. Every single one of these little dots, these white dots and these black dots, any idea what they represent? Here's a blown up version over here. All these fancy little codes here for each node. Every single one of those dots is a gene. Every one of them is a gene. And what this is actually showing is when you have an environmental cue, like say you increase pH or you decrease sunlight, what happens is these nodes, all of these different genes, they either get turned on or they get turned off in response to that environmental cue. And so that's what this is showing. All the black dots are getting turned on, the white dots are getting turned off. 
So you can see really quickly how this is like a huge nasty hairball, right? This would be super hard to understand if you just looked at it with the naked eye. But if you use a computer program to analyze those relationships, it's a lot faster and easier. So at ISB, we also write, um, we make technology to actually be able to analyze the data that we do collect because there's so much data. And oftentimes, there's not even really a good program to analyze it already. So we have to write our own. So we have software engineers here. We have um, uh, computer engineers. We have biologists, physicists, chemists, um, ecologists. We kind of have, we actually represent 45 different disciplines all in this building. So, so we're able to do cool things like that for that reason. OK, so Emily's going to take over for a little bit couple slides and talk about the global food crisis. Wherever you want to sit, it's fine. I might not be able to see you, though, if you sit there. It's up to you. Perfect. All right. So um, one oh. example. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't prep you for this. Otherwise, the microphone can hear you. So put that in your pocket. Okay. <laughs> oh, technology. <laughs> and that goes right here. Like Britney Spears. <laughs> like so? Yep. Okay. I feel very fancy right now. Okay, so one example of a complex system that fits really nicely under the umbrella of systems biology is agricultural production, so how we produce our food. And this diagram right here shows us how complex it is, how, how there are a lot of different nodes that feed into where we produce our food, how much food we produce, and who has access to it, essentially. Um, so can you guys think of a couple of factors that impact how much food we produce? Yeah, sure. Climate, weather patterns. Very good. Uh, what else besides climate? Yeah, amount of land, right? So an arable land in particular, like land that can be cultivated. Good. Yeah. Okay, good. So other environmental conditions like insects and pests. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Population. Yeah, definitely population for sure. So demographic factors, not only environmental conditions. What else? So you guys got a good number of them. But yeah, so there are many different, oops many different interacting factors that affect food production. And you guys named a lot of them, but other things like technology also affect how much food we can produce. Um, politics, right? So different laws and regulations affect um, how farmers, uh, you know, cultivate their land and might impact sort of if a country is politically unstable, might impact whether or not uh, food can be produced there. So you can think of all of these different factors as nodes within the agricultural production system, and they're all interrelated and affect one another. So it's a perfect system to study in systems biology, like we're doing in Project Feed. So despite the fact that um, we have advances in agricultural technology and we're sort of improving our systems of agricultural production, we still have this global food crisis where one in nine people in the world are undernourished. And this map that you see up here is a world hunger map. It shows the different proportions of people who are undernourished uh, by country. So there's a little key down here. Um, so for example, if a country is, let's see, this sort of maroon color, then over 35% of people in that country are undernourished. And we'll talk more on the next slide about sort of a specific definition of undernourishment and food security. Um, but so do you guys notice any patterns in terms of which geographical regions are more undernourished or more well-fed than others? Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, that's a really interesting observation. Yeah, it's a good one. Not a whole lot of, I mean, less access to transport routes. So that's a huge part of food security, right, is access to food. So yeah, very good. Any other patterns? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So developing countries in general, right, tend to have a greater percentage of their population at risk of undernourishment. And uh, specifically, the African region um, is particularly vulnerable to undernourishment. So um, very good. But so, you know, not only environmental conditions, but also economic conditions and political conditions impact uh, a, a country's food security, essentially. But Mostly in developing countries, we see this problem. Okay, good. So what are the, just you can shout them out, what are the most undernourished countries in the world? Can you guys read? I don't know how easy it is. Namibia? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, where is it? North Korea, Namibia, Zambia. Um, what is that? The Central African Republic. There's another teeny one that's kind of hard to spot. Haiti. Yeah, that's right. Haiti. Um, so, yeah, you'll notice again sort of this idea that it's not just environmental conditions or climate or geographical location, but other factors. Because, for example, we have Haiti up there, which is over 35% of people who are undernourished, right next to the Dominican Republic, um, which has 5 to 14% of the population undernourished. So there must be something else going on there besides environmental conditions and climate, right? Okay, good. So let's examine um, this overall concept of hunger and some specific definitions a little more closely. So someone want to read out the definition for undernourished for me? Don't be shy. <laughs> All right, I'll read it out. Undernourished. So hunger is a chronic state of undernourishment. So it's when a person is not able to acquire enough food to meet the daily minimum dietary energy requirements over a period of one year. So essentially not getting enough nutrition to fuel their bodies, okay? And it's measured, typically measured over the course of one year. And we talked about how, uh, you know, there are different patterns, global patterns of undernourishment uh, globally. And food security in particular, I'll just go ahead and read that one out. When all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So food security means not only, um, well, it means access to food, but access specifically to nutritious food. Um, and we talked about several different factors that can impact that. But... Does anyone want to take a stab at what the percent of undernourished, or yeah, what percentage of the US population is undernourished? Wild guess or educated guess? <laughs> Do you think it's 50%? No, <laughs> no, half of us are not undernourished. What about 30%? No? 20? 10? Maybe around 10? 5? 1? 1? Too low? Too high? <laughs> so it's under 5. It's under 5. And specifically, it's 4. So 4% 4 of the US is undernourished. But there's a lot of, like, if we look at the distribution of undernourishment within the country, you know, we see certain patterns as well. So 
just because the US as a whole um, is doing pretty well in terms of their levels of undernourishment, there are certain pockets of the country and certain populations that are particularly vulnerable to undernourishment. So it's not only a global issue, it's also a local issue. So for example, this graph, um, the darker shades show states that are um, have a higher a higher percentage of the population who is undernourished, and the lighter shades um, show states that are more food secure compared to the overall country average. So, for example, California um, has fewer undernourished people compared to Texas, for example. And again, lots of different potential factors playing into that: climate, economics socio-demographics, lots of different factors. Okay, so we have this global food crisis. One in nine people in the world are undernourished. Um, we talked about patterns of food insecurity globally and locally. And on top of that and playing into that global uh, food crisis, we have various environmental issues that we are facing, including increased incidence of drought across the world, soil loss, so decreases in soil fertility because of unsustainable farming practices, changing climate because of you know, our greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, again, because of unsustainable manufacturing, farming, et cetera, practices. So we've got this global food crisis. We, we're facing all of these large-scale environmental issues that um, are you know, becoming more urgent with time. And then on top of that, we also have this population growth issue, right? So we project that by 2050, in 33 years, there's going to be 10 billion people on the planet. 10 billion people. That's, that's a lot of people, right? And all of these um, different nodes in the system essentially play into one another, right? So overpopulation is possibly going to make our environmental issues more severe, which in turn is going to impact the percentage of people who are undernourished. So the big issue that's facing us and your generation moving forward is how will we feed 10 billion people by 2050 in an environmentally sustainable way? So in a way that protects our environment so that we can continue feeding people um, you know, and have nice green areas to uh, visit and a healthy fish to harvest from the ocean and, yeah, a sustainable system. How are we going to do that? So that's a big question we're facing right now. And that Project Feed is working on. This is the question that Project Feed is working on. Okay, over to you, Jessica. <laughs> Jessica's going to tell us how. Sure. Right, oh, thanks. Flip it on or... No, thank you. I'm just going to hold on to it, I guess. Okay, so back in like 2014, I was here and I was a teacher in the summer, and we started thinking about all of these global issues that um, Emily just mentioned, right? Like, and part of the focus of the Beliga Lab is to figure out how to um, help our environment, right? How to increase human wellness and how to increase environmental wellness. And we recognized that that was a really huge problem that faced a lot of people, this global food crisis. It's also a common problem that you guys hear about every day, right? Um, or you're driving down the streets of Seattle and you notice that there's food insecurity issues here too, right? Has everybody recognized that before in Seattle, probably? So it exists everywhere. It's not just in third world countries or you know, places we've never seen before. So what we really wanted to do here is focus on creating a paradigm shift toward sustainable living and figure out a way to scale up sustainable agriculture um, through these kind of three different strategies. So the first one is through training and educating people, mostly young people, and getting you guys excited about um, careers in STEM. Um, you guys know what STEM means? Science, technology, engineering, and math. You probably do if you've already applied for an internship at ISB. All right, um, so we want to train you guys and get you excited about being the future workforce in STEM. Um, did you know that there are already more jobs available in STEM than there are people that graduate with STEM degrees? 
it's crazy. And it's only going to get more and more, um, that gap is only going to get wider and wider. So we're trying to get, you know, you guys excited and, and trained up so that you are able to enter into those careers when you get out of high school and when you get out of college. Um, we also want to optimize food production systems, and we do that through research here at ISB, but we also do that through our citizen science program. So we get people like you and other hobbyists and scientists that are excited about doing research, and we help them set up systems, food production systems in their homes, and actually experiment on their own, and then upload data online to our website, which I'll talk about more later. And then finally, the last part of this is developing some kind of infrastructure to be able to support this network because there's so many people now that we work with. Um, we have over 140 citizen scientists across the country right now that are all collecting data and uploading it onto our website. Um, we've trained about 10,500 teachers and students. Um, we've gone to multiple um, career development and, and uh, professional development institutes for teachers to get them excited and trained. So there's a pretty large infrastructure that needs to be developed in order to support all of us, right, and manage this whole system together. So I'm going to kind of jump into each of these really quick and show you guys what we do. And I want you to be thinking about this in the context of if you are an ambassador and you go back to your schools, what are options of kind of projects that you can incorporate into your school? And so I'm showing you different um, kind of ways that you can use what you have through us, our resources, and incorporate them into your school or your community center, okay? Um, the first thing that we do is we write standards-based curriculum. Um, who knew that your teachers and your classes every day, they have these things called standards that they have to meet? Did you guys know that? There's like certain things that they absolutely have to teach you, and they get graded on whether or not they teach them correctly. Okay? So your AP environmental teacher has to teach something di very different than your AP biology teacher, and very different from your regular chemistry teacher. They all have different standards, right? And so what we do is we write this curriculum, and we make sure to list all of the standards that are met for each of those different lessons. So a teacher can pick it up and say, I need to teach... Um, NGSS HSLS2D <laughs> in my class, right? Doesn't really matter to you guys very much. But this is really important because if you find a teacher that you want to partner with at your school, they might not be super on board with starting a whole new program in their spare time. They're probably not going to have a lot of spare time. Okay? But if you can prove to them that the lessons that you have available that you know, incorporate aquaponics and food security and sustainable agriculture, if they already meet the standards that they have to teach in their classroom anyway, they're probably going to be more on board with getting excited and working with you on that project. Okay? So we have all of these resources available online. They're all free for teachers to use. Um, and then we are always here to help them kind of you know, teach them how to use the resources if they're confused about the PowerPoints or um, they don't understand the content. We're always here to help them understand that better too, okay? Um, the other thing we do is we do a lot of outreach. So these are five of my students that I had, and I actually took those students out into a middle school. And my high school students taught middle school students about um, sustainable agriculture and food security and aquaponics. So this is kind of another thing that Project Feed does. We do lots of outreach in different um, areas of Seattle mostly. Um, and if you guys are interested, that's another kind of way you can incorporate your project into your community is by doing outreach. Um, say you're really excited and you're interested in being a teacher at some point, or you really like young kids, or you work with um, maybe the Pacific Science Center or another local community organization, you can set up an outreach event and go teach those groups. They might not be in high school, they might be younger than you, and that's okay too. Okay. Okay, um, the other thing that we do through ISB, I'll go back to the slide again, is we do research and experimentation through Project Feed, right? So something to think about here is if we're thinking again about the global food crisis, there are a lot of different questions that need to be addressed, right, and, and figured out. So one of them is, like, how do we make the most food with the fewest resources? Because right now we're using a lot of natural resources, right, to make our food. How can we reduce that? That's one question. How could we grow vegetables and protein at the same time? That's another question. Hey, Nitin. 
Um, how do we reduce pollution? How do we increase access to food? So there's all of these very complex, large-scale issues that we need to tackle. And one of the ways that we can kind of get at answering all of those questions is by um, encouraging this big network of citizen scientists like you guys around the country to kind of take control and answer these questions in your own homes or at your schools or in your community centers. So that is why we started working with citizen science and finding people like you and other people around Seattle and around the world to kind of tackle these big, um, complex questions, okay? So before we move into this, I'll introduce really quick, this is Dr. Nitin Baliga. He's the um, principal investigator of our lab. You wanna give a little insight into what you do? Yeah. Baliga is also the senior vice president of the Institute for Systems Biology. So he plays, um, as well as a faculty role and a PI role, he also is very involved in kind of the management and the development of the institute. So. Yeah, so if you have any questions, you'll get to see more. Hopefully, you'll visit us. If you don't have any questions, now, I'll be able to start the topic. Thanks, Ben. Well, good to see you guys. Thank you. All right, put my Britney Spears mic back on. I feel like I need to sing or something. Okay, so citizen science. We were just jumping into what that is. Has anybody heard of citizen science before? No one before today has heard of citizen science, no? Okay, so citizen science is basically when you guys, um, individual people, they volunteer their time um, or resources in some way in order to conduct research and share that with the larger scientific community. Okay, so you guys are basically scientists at home and then you share your, your resources and your um, data maybe that you collect with other people and that helps us further research. Um, so that's why, that's how this is helping our project as well. The data that you guys collect from food systems, if you decide to build a food system as part of your project, um, that will help with our larger question of how to grow more food in the future and solve maybe this food insecurity issue, right? And so you can see up here, we've actually had quite a few citizen scientists. This, um, I had a group of medical science students that I taught two years ago at Lake Washington Institute for Technology, and they each built all of their own aquaponic systems from materials at, um, from Goodwill. And they were all less than $20. And they all functioned correctly, and they all grew food. So there's, there, there's kind of one way you can be a citizen scientist is DIY your own system and um, you can even use super low cost materials from somewhere like Goodwill. And then they came here, this is actually a picture of the same room, and they presented all of their research to scientists at Institute for Systems Biology. 
during a discussion group. Um, we also have farmers that are part of our citizen science network. This is one of our farmers in Port Angeles, and she is trying to grow different types of crops with different types of fish. So she doesn't like tilapia. If you guys have looked into um, aquaponics at all, she doesn't really like tilapia. And tilapia is actually a tropical fish species, so they don't, they don't live here normally, right? In Washington, that wouldn't make sense. So what she tries to do is she uses fish from her local area. So she's using Arctic char and trying to grow food using Arctic char as a fish source instead of tilapia, which you'll understand more later why that's so awesome and crazy, <laughs> if you don't yet. Um, we also have a, a large number of teachers and students around the country. Both of these classrooms are in different areas of Florida, um, but the students built all of their own systems there and are contributing data to our system, or to our um, online website. And then here, we go to places like UW quite often to like the sustainability festivals um, and the Earth Day festivals, and we get other people, like undergraduate students involved in becoming citizen scientists too. And oftentimes we'll hand out these uh, aquaponic kits or we'll do like a raffle so somebody can win one um, or we can also provide those to people if they need them for a classroom space. Okay. So I wanted to kind of lay out how crowdsourced research works. So we're using citizen science to crowdsource research, right? Using a crowd to collect data. So this is just an example. Say this is your high school and say for example we have 49 other high schools. Um, which is actually lower than the number that we currently are working with. And say that each of those schools has an aquaponic system. It doesn't have to be a little system like this. It could be bigger. It could be a DIY system. And say that each of you does three experiments per system per year. How many experiments then could we all do together in one year? 150, right? That is a lot of experiments. That would be impossible for us to do here at ISB in one year. Um, I, throughout the, school, or throughout the school year, I'm the only person here that does research on aquaponics. And then during the summer, I usually have someone like Courtney, who is an undergraduate intern. Um, and then sometimes I also have teachers that are here. But that's only for about eight to 10 weeks of the summer that we have help. So this is super important if we are going to advance kind of the future of sustainable agriculture, is doing this crowdsourced research and having a lot of different people doing these different experiments, like Dr. Baliga mentioned. And this is just an example of kind of one portion of the data management site that you guys are going to learn how to use today. Um, but the cool thing about this is that this is one food system here. This is another one here, there's another one here and here, and you can actually get online and figure out kind of how these patterns and trends are similar or different between systems across the world. So you could compare your system to one in Florida, to one in Texas, and a different one in Washington, for example. Okay, okay so I wanted to move into kind of how we recruit people. So one of the ways is through our ambassador program, right? You guys are all getting trained to, to scale up sustainable agriculture and do research. We also do something called train the trainer, um, where typically I go train other um, adults and then they go to high school classrooms. So I did one um, last year with Microsoft and we have a bunch of Microsoft employees now that go out to different areas in the community and train high school students as well. Hi. That's okay, what's your name? Tabitha, nice to meet you. You want to um, sit in one of these seats over here, Tabitha? Once you get all settled in, I'll have you introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, um, question for you guys. Why do you think a teacher would want to participate in citizen science? I want to hear your thoughts. Why would they want to participate in citizen science and why would they not just use their curriculum the way that they normally do and not participate? Think about this in the eyes of a teacher. Put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah, a, yeah, a change of pace. Maybe they want to contribute to the community in some way. Good. What else? Good. Yeah, good. It gets the students to connect what they're doing in the classroom with what's actually happening in the real world. That's pretty tough to do, actually, as a teacher, to find like a way to actually merge with what you're learning in the classroom with something that's actually happening in the real world. Yeah. You have another thought? Good. 
good, yeah. It would inspire them to become teachers themselves. Maybe they feel like they're not just teaching to the test anymore, like they can actually do project-based learning. So very good, those are good ideas. And then finally, I have one other question. Um, so our question was kind of, how can we meet the needs of the project while also fulfilling academic requirements and preparing students to solve future issues? So even though you guys may want to do this in the classroom and maybe teachers really want to do this in the classroom too, we still do have to fulfill academic requirements, right? And that's, like I said earlier, why we have standards that are aligned to each of those lessons. Um, and then even beyond that, there's a lot of other ways that you can help your teacher figure out like, okay, I have an aquaponics system. What is possibly happening in my system that I could relate to your classroom. So say chemistry, for example. If you, want, if you knew your chemistry teacher really, really well, and you knew that they'd be excited about building an aquaponics system, can you off the top of your head think of maybe one thing that they could teach? I know you don't know a lot about aquaponics yet, but what's something you guys have learned in chemistry that you think might relate to sustainable food? How many of you have taken chemistry? Okay, so all of you should be able to <laughs> maybe think of something here. What do you guys think? How to control environmental factors? Like what? What's one environmental factor? Good. Yeah, maybe pH, if you want to increase or decrease the pH. You guys talk a lot about like ion exchange, pH levels, right? Yes, I would hope in chemistry. Okay, good. Anything else you can think of? Or a different class, maybe say you're in physics. Any of you guys like physics or engineering? What's something you could incorporate, do you think? Yeah, actually building the systems themselves, that requires a lot of engineering, right? Making blueprints and figuring out what materials you need and designing them, very good. Yeah, so there's a lot of ways to kind of work with the academic requirements in each classroom and still do project-based learning. Okay, and build aquaponic systems. Um, also, I would say that like, for example, if you're a biology teacher, you may not be as interested in building the system, for example, and spending time with engineering in your class, but maybe you're more interested in lo looking at ecosystems, right, and understanding how all the components in the water interact with each other. Yeah, so you don't always have to build the system in the classroom necessarily. Okay, so now we know a little bit more about citizen science. We're going to talk about aquaponics really quick, which is probably why most of you are excited and here today. Okay, so aquaponics. Who's heard of it before and understands how it works? Somewhat? Okay. So what I'm going to do is first kind of compare conventional agriculture to aquaponics, and then we'll talk specifically about what aquaponics is. But just to give you an overview, this is kind of the way that we currently farm right now. Okay, called conventional agriculture, or traditional agriculture. Typically what this kind of consists of is putting one type of crop in the soil and doing it over a very large area and doing a lot of it, right? So if you think of like a, um, a field of corn, anybody drive, th drive through Iowa before? Or like somewhere in the Midwest? That's where I lived for 14 years, just monoculture of Corn everywhere, all over the place. Okay, that's kind of what I think of with this conventional agriculture technique. We try to increase yield as high as we can. We grow as much of it with um, the least amount of resources as we can so that it is cost effective, right? Okay, but this is kind of what ends up happening. Um, when we grow food this way, we use a lot of water and we waste a lot of water, okay? We actually use more water for agriculture than we use for anything else in the entire world more than for industry, for personal use, um, anything else that you can think of using water for in the world, we use more for agriculture, okay? Um, and then on top of that, we take out a lot of water from the ground usually or from you know, somewhere else, depending on where you live in the world, and about half of that actually gets wasted. So you put it into the soil and it either goes down into the groundwater and never actually gets taken up by plants or it runs off 
somewhere or it evaporates before it's used, but a lot of that water actually gets wasted and never even is used to make food in the first place. Okay? Um, soil use is really, really high. Right now, it, we basically only use soil to grow food. Okay? So we require soil for conventional agriculture, which means that we also require arable land. Does anybody know what arable means? Take, just take a guess. What do you think it means? Arable land. Yeah. Maybe land that provides nutrients to grow certain plants or that is able to produce what we want. Good. That's exactly right. Just land that is able to grow food, essentially, right? So not all land is arable land, right? Like if we went out to the desert, there's land in the desert, right? Is it arable? Probably not. There's not a lot of nutrients in it. Um, it's made more maybe of silt or sand than, you know, a different combination of, of, um, of soil. Okay, so productivity, kind of average, and I just write average here because I'm comparing it to aquaponics, which is quite a bit higher than the productivity in conventional agriculture. Um, there's a lot of seasonality involved with conventional agriculture, right? Can we grow strawberries using conventional agriculture all year round? Everywhere in the world? No. Uh, we can import it from other places that do it, probably, right? Um, nutrients. What do I mean by used and removed here? What do you think? Nutrients. Yeah. Um, I grow like, tons of wheat on like 200 acres of property, and we always have to move the wheat to different sections because the nutrients we sow are used. So mm. you have to take time. Good, yeah, exactly. So essentially when you grow plants on land, the plants take up all the nutrients out of the soil, right? And then you harvest them and they go away with the plants, right? So there's really not very much left in the soil. So what do we typically do in order to add nutrients back into the soil? What are some different techniques we use? What'd you say? Cycling, good, like crop cycling, going from one patch to the next to the next, good. Oh, good. Did you say soybeans? Like legumes and things like that that fix nitrogen? Good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what you guys use? Uh, yeah, Usually? Okay. So you can add fertilizers into the soil. You can add manure. Manure is essentially a fertilizer, right? A natural fertilizer. Good. Okay, so that's typically how we do um, our crop growing right now with nutrients. And then the interesting thing here is that we've been doing it this way for thousands of years, right? Um, and we pass it on from generation to generation even now, so everybody kind of understands how to do it the same way. So there's a lot of scientific knowledge available on how this works, right? Like if you wanted to pick up and be a farmer, you could probably find a, a lot of manuals on how to grow wheat correctly, right? And maybe everybody has a slightly different strategy, but in general, we've been doing it for so long that there's a lot of knowledge available, right? Okay, let's jump over here to aquaponics really quick. So with aquaponics, and this is good to write down too, these are all good facts that you can share with your peers and with your teacher and everything. Um, water use and waste is really, really low. In general, you use about 10%, 5 to 10% of the water that you would use in conventional agriculture to use to grow the same number of crops. 5 to 10% of the water. So it's very low in water use. And there is zero water waste. There's nowhere for the water to go except for to be used by the plants. There is, I guess there is evaporation. So there's a small amount that can be um, wasted that way. OK, um, soil use. You actually don't use any soil in aquaponics. It's completely soilless. We'll talk about what you can use instead of soil later. OK, land requirement. Do you think you have to be on arable land for aquaponics if you don't use soil? Probably not. You could do it essentially anywhere. You could do it in a parking garage, which we'll see in a second. You could do it on the roof of a building. You could do it in the middle of the city in Seattle. Or you could do it in the middle of Iowa if you really wanted to, right? But you can do it anywhere. Um, productivity is very high. So in general, you grow food about three times faster than you do using conventional agriculture. And that's because you have nutrients that are constantly being recycled in the system. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. Actually, Emily will show you how that works in just a second. 
Um, there's some seasonality involved, but in general, because you're not growing it out in the middle of a pasture like you would with arable land, you can actually control some of the seasonality. You can add lights. Um, you can control the climate a little bit differently. So there's less seasonality involved. Um, and then the nutrients, the nice thing here is that they're mostly recycled. So the nutrients that you add into the system actually get recycled over and over within the system. Now the issue here down at the bottom is this disparity between the amount of information that we have about conventional agriculture and the amount of information we have about aquaponics. And aquaponics has been around for thousands of years. It originated back in Asia a long time ago, um, but it's just kind of catching up um, traction and speed here in the United States and in other parts of the world. And because of that, there's very little scientific knowledge on exactly how the system functions, um, what bacteria are important to make the system function, um, different combinations of plants and animals that work well together. There's very little information. So this, again, is one of those reasons why we work really hard to create ambassadors so that you guys can go out and train other people and get other people interested. Um, and also why we started the citizen science program so that we can increase this right here, the scientific knowledge that's available. Okay. Any questions about this so far? We're going to talk about exactly what aquaponics is next. So that should be helpful. All right. Emily's going to take you. <laughs> no, no worries. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about aquaponics, and some of it might be, some of it you might already know, because I know that some of you guys have been to the Ambassador Conference in the spring and you know, have been involved or interested in Project Feed for a while. So some might be, uh, some of this you might already know, but hopefully I'll teach you a little bit about the nitty gritty of how it all works, um, specifically the nitrogen cycle and why that's really important. And then I'll start talking a little bit about how to use water chemistry to make sure that your aquaponics system is going is progressing in the way that you want it to essentially and then i'll hand it over to courtney and then we'll do some hands-on stuff okay so aquaponics is essentially the combination of two different food production systems the first one is aquaculture which is raising aquatic organisms so raising things like fish or shrimp or shellfish and so in an aquaculture system, you essentially, oops, no, not that, not that. So you essentially keep your organisms in ponds or tanks and you input, you need to input 
food into the system, okay, to feed your organisms. And then the output from the system is the feces of your organism, so fish waste, essentially. So we're combining aquaculture with the second food production system, hydroponics. And hydroponics is growing plants without soil, so essentially you just use water. And ideally, in a hydroponic system, you only add uh, the amount of nutrients that the plants will need. So ideally, you're not going to have any waste coming out of the system because the plants are going to take up all of the nutrients in the water. So aquaponics combines these two systems into one. And can you guys tell me how that works? How, like, which parts of each system are integrated into the other system? Yeah, very good. Exactly. So that's exactly how they are connected. The waste from the aquaculture uh, is input into the hydroponic system and it essentially provides the nutrients for the lettuce or whatever you're growing to grow. But the other part of that is that the plants filter out that waste from the water and that clean water cycles back up into the tanks or the ponds so that the organisms have clean water, right? Because essentially if the water gets too dirty, that's not going to be good for them either. So that's essentially aquaponics combining these two different cycles, um, these two different systems in a cycle. So there are three main components to aquaponics. We've got fish, which we talked about, or some other aquatic organism. We have plants, which we talked about. But uh, not so obvious is the bacterial component of the system, which is super important. Without a well-functioning bacterial component, your aquaponic system is not going to work. And so the reason why the bacterial component is so important is because it transforms the waste from our organisms down here into a usable form that the plants can use. So the main a uh, nutrient that comes out of the waste is a nitrogen-containing compa compound called ammonia. I'm sure you guys have all heard about that in chemistry. Yeah? Okay, and so it converts ammonia to a different nitrogen-containing compa compound called nitrate in a, a couple of steps. And nitrate is the form of nitrogen that the plants can actually use. Okay, so they can't use the ammonia, they can use the nitrate. So that step is absolutely essential, this conversion from ammonia to nitrate. And then the plants filter out the nitrate from the water, and the clean water goes back into the tank or the pond that you are using. Okay, so three main components. So I want to talk to you a little more about the nitrogen cycle and specifically how this transformation of ammonia to nitrate takes place because understanding this cycle is really essential to you guys running your own successful aquaponics system. So have you guys learned about the nitrogen cycle already? Yeah, maybe in biology a little bit, maybe chemistry. Has anyone taken environmental science? No? <laughs> Maybe in biology, ecology. <laughs> okay, so step number one. Okay, we've got our organisms at the top here, our fish or our shrimp or whatever, and they uh, produce feces or fish poo. And the fish poo plus potentially we're going to have some decaying plant matter in there as well is going to produce this nitrogen compound ammonia, NH3 or NH4. Um, okay, so that's our first step. The problem is that ammonia is toxic to fish and plants. It's, it's not good for their growth. So we need to somehow get rid of that in our aquaponic system. So that takes us to step number two, which is the first part of the nitrification, what we call the nitrification process. And in step two, we have a group of bacteria called the nitrosomonas bacteria. And what they do is they transform this ammonia into a different nitrogen-containing compound called nitrite. So chemically, what's the difference between those two compounds? It's not a trick question. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're just kind of swapping out the nitrogen for the oxygen right there. But despite the hard work of the nitrosomonas bacteria, nitrite is still not good for our plants or fish. So we still need to take it another step and convert it to our following nitrogen-containing compound, nitrate. And so what's the difference between nitrite and nitrate? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So nitrite has two oxygens, nitrate has three oxygens, and the type of bacteria that helps facilitate that process is called nitrobacter bacteria. Okay, so that's part two of the nitrification process. And the good news at this point is that nitrate is good for plant growth. Okay, so now we finally have nitrogen in a form that is useful for our plants to grow. And so step four in the process is uh, that plants are fertilized by this nitrate that has been produced, transformed from ammonia by these two different groups of bacteria. And the plants are fertilized, and importantly, they, you know, they take up the nitrogen-containing compounds, and the water cycles back, and these guys have clean water to swim around in and be happy. Any questions on the nitrogen cycle and why it's important to our aquaponic system? OK. Actually, I have a question that I... <laughs> And Jessica or Courtney could answer this. What remind me what the difference between NH three and NH four is? Do you guys? Yeah. But are they named differently? Ammonia and ammonium. Okay, ammonia and ammonium. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So we've learned about our nitrogen cycle, but now I want to talk to you a little bit about how we're going to apply that knowledge to monitoring our system to make sure that it's progressing in the way that we want it to. Okay? So this graph shows on the x-axis time. So what I want you to imagine is that time zero, we're setting up our new aquaponic system. And then we're going to be taking water quality measurements um, at strategic time points, okay? And then on the y-axis, we have nitrogen levels in parts per million, I think, yeah. Okay, so at time zero, and you guys are gonna help me figure out what's going on here, we've got our ammonia concentration going up. Why might, might our ammonia concentration be going up when we start out? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically, our fish or our prawns or whatever are pooing. They're producing waste. So the ammonia concentration is going up. And the, sorry, really quick. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
thanks. <laughs> okay, so our ammonia concentration is going up because of the fish waste. Very good. Okay, at our next time point, we see that nitrite starts to, the concentration of nitrite starts to increase. Why might that be? Yeah. Yeah, very good. So that's where our nitrosomonas bacteria are starting to come in and starting to convert the ammonia to nitrite. Okay, so, but what's happening to the ammonia as the nitrite goes up? Yeah, it's decreasing because it's being converted to nitrite. Very good. Okay, so then at our next time point, we start to see nitrate appearing in the system. Why is that? Yeah, that's right, the nitrobacter. Good, they're starting to convert the nitrite to nitrate. So that's that step of the process. And so as the nitrate's going up, what's happening to the other, the concentrations of the other two compounds? Yeah, so we see nitrate going up, ammonia continues to decrease, and right where we see nitrate start to be produced, nitrite starts to go down, okay? Because they're all part of that cycle. So when one starts to go up, then it must be using the one before it to transform it into that particular compound. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, so with that understanding of the nitrogen cycle and how uh, observing concentrations of certain nitrogen compounds sort of relates to concentrations of other nitrogen compounds. Here we have uh, four different water quality, sets of water quality measurements, A, B, C, and D. Okay, so we're measuring values, and I don't want you to worry too much about um, units, although I guess are the units parts per million, or? Okay, so the units for the first three are parts per million, but what's more important is the uh, relative quantities. So just kind of focus on relative quantities. So we're looking at the three nitrogen-containing compounds. We're also looking at pH and chlorine. And what I want you guys to do right now for the next couple of minutes is try and figure out along this timeline or sort of in what order those different water quality measurements were taken. So which one was taken first in our system, which one was taken second, which one was taken third, and which one was taken fourth. So take a couple minutes just by yourself to try figure that out and then we'll come together and discuss what you guys think. Okay? Does that, any, any questions on what I'm asking you to do? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher Jessica comes out. <laughs> Yeah, that was so fast. <laughs> I think they did already. They're super fast. <laughs> okay. All right. Who wants to tell me which one is which one comes first? Go ahead. D. That is correct. Good. Why does D come first? Yeah, very good. So that's the only one that has, well, it has the highest ammonia level. Very good. Okay, which one comes second? Go ahead. B. 
That is correct. Why? Yeah, very good. So ammonia has decreased a little bit because some of it's been converted to nitrite, and we still don't see any nitrate yet. So we know that it's early in the system. Nice. Okay, which one's uh, three? Someone different. Yeah. A? Correct. Why is A number three? Okay, very good. So we still have some residual nitrite in the system, but ammonia has disappeared and nitrate is, has now appeared. Okay, good. So that only leaves... Which one? Yeah. Uh, C. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So all of the other, both of these two nitrogen containing compounds have been converted to nitrate. Very good. Okay, so did you guys uh, notice any other patterns? Yeah. Yes, the pH is decreasing. And what is what does pH measure? It's in hydrogen, yes. Or the acidity in general, yeah. So, uh, so is the solution becoming more acidic or more basic? Mm -hmm. Can anybody think of why? Man, you guys are good. <laughs> yeah, so you got, yeah, when the ammonia is being converted into nitrite and nitrate, it's shedding hydrogen ions, so it's making the solution a little more acidic. Um, what else? Anything else? Okay, why, why do you think that might be? Mm, not really involved in the nitrification process. But it's a good guess. <laughs> When you think, when you hear chlorine, what do you think of? Shout it up. The pool. The pool. What does chlorine do in the pool? Mm hmm. That's sorry, what? Interesting. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but. Um, yeah, what, so, so we know that we put it in pools to disinfect water, okay, so what might we have used to create our aquaponic system in the first place? What source of water? Yeah, tap water. And might there be some chlorine in tap water? Yeah, we do use uh, chlorine, some chlorine to purify tap water. So we might have find a little bit of chlorine in the tap water. Do you think chlorine is good for our aquaponic system? Yeah, no, so, I mean, what is an essential component of an aquaponic system? Bacteria, right? So <laughs> chlorine's not going to distinguish for us but between the good and the bad bacteria, so it also could kill the bacteria that we added to our system. So 
Jessica told me that there's a little trick that you can use to get rid of the chlorine if you are using tap water to build your aquaponic system, and that is, you know, just to leave the water sitting for 48 hours, right? Because the chlorine vaporizes, essentially, it'll gas off naturally. So before you add your organisms to, and if you're using tap water, then just let it sit for a while so that that chlorine disappears. Okay, did I miss anything? Good to know. Uh, hmm. It's not switching slides. There we go. OK, so I'm going to pass this over to back to Jessica. Yeah. And so she's, yeah. You guys feel like you know enough about water chemistry now in aquaponic systems? Okay, good success. With actual water chemistry samples. <laughs> All right, so this is what I'm going to have you guys do. Um, see, one, two, three, four. Okay, so with the person next to you, I'm going to give you a water chemistry sample, or water sample. I don't like wearing this thing, but I think that the video needs me to wear it so that it hears me. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you a water sample. And then I'm going to kind of teach you how to use the water chemistry test strips that we use at ISB and that you guys can also use um, when you start your own systems. So I'll have you guys be tank three. And this actually will, uh, I might want to set it up right somehow, sorry. <laughs> this might spill a little bit. Um, let's just do tank three and tank, here you go. Here's tank one. Here's tank three for you guys. And tank one for you guys. All right. And then what we are going to do is collect data from all of your samples using this water chemistry testing guide. And I can give each of you guys one of these before you leave today. Um, the ones that are laminated, I need back. But you can write on these with vis -vis markers if you want to right now, if you want to take notes. So there's two different types of test strips that we use to measure water chemistry. And they're both on these kind of little cheat sheets. There's one test strip on the, le on the left um, that's the ammonia test strip. And it only measured amo measures ammonia, right? And then there's another test strip that we use on the right that is called a six-in-one test strip. And it measures six different water chemistry parameters in one strip. So it measures nitrate, nitrite, pH, hardness, chlorine, and alkalinity. Um, have any of you guys ever used a test strip like this to measure water chemistry? Even for like a pool or anything you have before? Like in a fish tank, maybe? OK, cool. Good. So I have all of those strips up here. And what I want you to notice first is that all of these, each of these two strips have different procedures. Did you notice that? So you don't use the two strips in the same way. So first, look at the ammonia test strip. The first thing you have to do is remove one test strip from the bottle, which I'll give you. Whew. And then um, hold the end of the test strip into the water sample. So you want to hold the end that does not have the um, actual test on that end, right? You don't want your finger to touch the test part itself. Um, you put it into the water, and then you kind of swirl it around in the water for about 10 seconds. So make sure you and your partner are counting to 10. Once you take it out of the water, you are immediately going to compare the color of your test to the color on the test um, key next to it, OK? Um, do you guys notice that there's two keys for ammonia? What's the difference between them? Fresh water and salt water. Fresh water and salt water. Do you think we're going to have fresh water samples or salt water samples? Fresh water. These are all from aquaponic systems at ISB. Okay. So this is a fresh water sample. Um, and then the other kit, the other test, um, has six other tests on it, but it has a different procedure. You're going to hold it again by the tip that does not have the tests on it, dip it into the water for this time one second. We are not holding it in the water, OK? One second, then you take it right out, 
set it horizontally on the table. It's okay if you get wet, you know, water and stuff on the table, that's fine. Um, set it down and then count to 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, what does it say to do? Hold the strip level. Okay, hold it level. And then once you get to 30 seconds of counting, what do you compare? Alkalinity, yeah. Uh-huh. Good. Okay. So basically, after 30 seconds, you measure everything on the test strip except what? Does it say that? Oh, this one says all of them. Okay. So compare them all after 30 seconds. I think the back of some of these says 60 seconds, but you can do it after 30. Okay. So they have slightly different procedures. So be careful when you're using the strips because if you leave them out longer than they should be, what do you think happens? before you compare. Yeah, your color is probably gonna keep changing every second, right? The longer you wait to read it, the more exposed the color is going to get. And that's probably not an accurate reading of what your actual parts per million is, right, in your system. So make sure you follow those procedures really closely. So what I'm gonna do is come around and give you guys each, um, or each of you guys one of these two test strips. And then I'm also gonna have you record your data on a data collection sheet. So first write it in your notebook and then I'll pass this data collection sheet around and we'll put all of our data together on here, okay? Um, at the top of this page, I want you guys to write down whether you are doing tank one or tank three. You can put that under date and maybe your initials too so we know whose data is whose, okay? All right, any questions before you get started? Sure, you wanna hand out one of those to each person and one of those to each person? and then put the lid right back on if you can. Thank you.
Here's the data collection sheet. Oh, we're still passing. One more group. Okay, the next thing I want you to talk with your um, partner about is I want you to kind of describe what you think is happening in your system right now. Okay, is it an aquaponic system? Is it an aquarium with no plants? Um, is it at the beginning of its kind of cycling process? Is it at the end? Describe as much in as much detail in your notebook as you can with your partner. Talk with your partner, write it in your notebook. <laughs> That's probably confusing. <laughs> Write it down, talk with your partner. The fish feces. like get them going, see if Annie can come from two to three. That way they can keep working on it. Because I think the sonic, or wait, no, we're not sonicating. We're just doing extractions. Yeah, so maybe she could help finish it up if you want to by two. Does that work? You want me to reach out to her? Are you OK? Yeah, that would be cool. We're going to collect bio ball samples this week, too. 